This is Field Notes from UW-Madison Extension, and I'm Will Fulwider. We bring farmers, experts, and agronomists to the table to talk about research-based approaches to the issues facing agriculture in Wisconsin. Today, we're talking about agrivoltaics, a fancy word for the co-location of solar panels in agriculture. There's a lot of solar being cited in Wisconsin, and as a result, there's agriculture leaving the landscape. But there's also potential to integrate both the energy production and the agricultural activities. So you could call it a cutting edge topic. And so we've got a cutting edge person to help us out with it today. Stefan. Hey, Will. I'm here. And that's what I do. I help run a podcast called The Cutting Edge that tackles topics just like this and highlights emerging crops like hazelnuts and hemp and a bunch of others for Wisconsin. Shout out to listen to their podcast, The Cutting Edge, which is located right next door to us on the UW Extension Crops and Soils page or a short internet search away. On this episode, we'll be hearing about the latest practices and research on integrating agriculture and solar. We'll be talking with Sarah Moser from Savion Energy and Eric Romick from The Ohio State University about growing hay and row crops under the panels. So let's dive right in. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Mosier from Savion. I'm the Director of Farming Operations and Agrivoltaics. Um, I'm actually a farmer as well in Northwest uh, Ohio. We farm about 1,500 acres. I farm with my dad and my brother and my husband. Um, so family farm, uh, corn, wheat, and soybeans. We actually added livestock to the operation. So, so we're doing it all right now. Um, I do live in a wind farm, and uh, we have had some people sign us up for solar as well. So we're familiar with that on the farming side of the house. And then of course I'm doing development and working with Savion to bring the two together. So that's me. Excellent. Eric, who are you? <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Will, and thanks for having me. My name's Eric Romick. I'm a Ohio State University Extension Field Specialist for Energy Education. Um, so I've I've been with with Extension since 2008, and um, you know I started as a as a county based uh, Extension educator, and really uh, in that county role, kind of had my first experience with renewable energy development and uh, working with uh, you know at, at the time what we thought was a massive project, right, an 85 acre uh, solar field in in uh, the county. And so that was kind of my first exposure to, to renewable energy development and, you know, uh, taking a look at kind of the, the good, bad and, and otherwise and, and how those projects uh, impact communities in, in various ways. And so since uh, that that time, I guess, in 08 and in, in 2012, I, I moved into the statewide position where uh, I just focus solely on energy education now. And, and I get pulled into uh, really everything from oil and gas development and in the eastern part of the state to uh, wind up in the northwest and, and you know, utility scale solar development all across the state. Over the years, we've done a lot of, of financial modeling for farmers that were interested in putting solar in on their farm to, to power their operations behind the meter. So, um, you know, really get kind of pulled into a lot of different aspects uh, within energy. And, and certainly since I'd say 2016, uh, you know, utility scale solar development has really been the the topic that's drawing the most attention right now here in Ohio. Sounds like you've got a lot of projects going on, but we want today we want to focus on one specific project, and that is this between the rows project that you have uh, as a partnership between Savion Energy and Ohio State. Eric, can you speak a little bit more about the research that's currently underway with the with this project between the rows? When we look at solar, the the one weakness as as we've seen these projects scale up is that they have a large footprint, right? It takes a lot of horizontal surface area to generate the power. And so, you know, we were trying to explore what types of multi land use options exist within the parameters of of two key points. So, is it economical? Because we want something that the industry will adopt, right? So this gets commercialized and, and put into practice. And is it scalable? Can this be a solution that can scale up to thousands and thousands of acres? And so I, I try and really highlight that point that we're not discounting other agrivoltaic um, practices, but we were really focused on what can we scale up and what can be economical. So um, our team at OSU was really interested in forage production. And, um, you know, obviously we have some forage specialists on our team, but 
uh, as we were kind of putting together the, the parameters of a research project, obviously we needed a partner for a site. And that's when we kind of partnered with Sarah and Savion and, um, you know, through the, the between the rows uh, partnership with Savion, we were able to identify a research site that allowed us to quickly just answer uh, a couple of questions. And so we really wanted to initially look at this and say, you know, what are the best practices for establishment? Does it grow? And what's the quality? So if you could imagine um, at, at, at this research site, we have uh, essentially three alleys. So an alley being, you know, that space in between two solar arrays, right? So we had a cool season hay mix in the first alley, uh, alfalfa in the second alley, uh, a, a mixture of, I guess we'll just say cover crops at this point in the third alley. And then we had our control zone that was outside of the solar arrays. And then with each of those seed uh, varieties, we had uh, varying seeding rates. So we did 75% of the recommended rate, 100% of the recommended rate, uh, and 125% of the recommended seeding rate. Um, and then the final um, kind of cross section there would be, as, as mentioned, this is a fixed tilt system. So there's portions of these alleys that uh, experience pretty intense shade, whereas the other half, or I should say two thirds experience, you know, full sunlight exposure. So um, kind of monitoring the differences in shade versus sun as well is something that we were really interested in. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're sitting here now, we've we've completed kind of two growing seasons. So we had our establishment year and then, um, you know, in, in year two, we really got some really good data in terms of um, the forage quality and, and how the, the crops were, were producing. So. Great. We'll get back to what those kind of results were saying here in a second. Sarah, anything to add to that? I know that you're kind of you, you're doing the hay inside of things, but you're also really interested in growing crops, corn, beans under these solar panels. So I'm curious where things stand with that. Um, yeah, for sure. So first, like as a farmer, you know, you look at these sites and you you see it and you see ground that you can use, right? And so every landowner that I talk to is like, hey, have you thought about growing soybeans in there or pumpkins or, I mean, you, you've, you've heard it all, right? All these different specialty crops, you see them doing it out in Colorado, you see them doing it places where, where they're trying different things. And, you know, Eric's team and Eric made a great point that, that having something that will be scalable when you're talking about 1200 acres, um, we have a project that's 6,000 acres. I mean, so, so when you have that much space, it's, it, that's, that's a lot of tomatoes, you know, that's a lot of cucumbers if you go out and you do produce. And so and it's even, you know, you see grazing everywhere. It's a lot of sheep. Um, so Eric's solution and Ohio State's solution of forage crop in this hay and this alfalfa really made sense and resonated with me um, because one, we got to feed all of those sheep if we do start a market for it when we do the grazing on solar sites. But then, you know, my my heart definitely lies with the soybean and, you know, and corn. So, um, you know, Eric mentioned the site is on our farm and uh, we maybe have planted an alleyway in soybeans. I've actually got corn growing in one right now. So so I'm testing a little bit outside. The Ohio State project is done because we've kind of moved up and moved to a, a different or a bigger project. Um, so I can kind of play with it a little bit the way that, you know, I'm able to. And and I, I won't lie, I took my my 20 foot drill down through there and, and, you know, we got stuff growing. So we know it grows and we're, and we're working on it. But you know, it's interesting and it's wonderful to have Ohio State involved and, in, you know, that that you guys are doing this with with your extension agencies, because as a farmer, we know it'll grow, but we need that research and we need those numbers and that data and everything to go with it to, to prove the science behind it and say, yeah, we know it'll grow, but we can prove it will grow and we see the numbers and the crude proteins and what's coming out of it. So so that's kind of help establish the story to, to the people that need to make the investment to to go bigger. Right. So I'm wondering, um, Sarah, so what kind of considerations were involved, you know, when thinking about partnering with Ohio State um, University in um, designing this solar field for agrivoltaics? You know, what what went into that? decision-making process of, of partnering with them? I would say a lot of it is, is like Eric mentioned, the economics. So, you know, what's it going to cost us as a developer to make these sites accessible to farmers? So your insurance, your liability of having people on site and operating, um, but then the engineering and the design that goes behind it. You know, if you're raising the panels, 
It costs more in steel. Uh, if you're burying cable, it takes more time with your construction um, methods. So, you know, we're really just looking to have the solution make sense to both the farmer and the industry. Yeah, I, I can kind of add to that a little bit. Um, I've started to kind of use the phrase solar ready, uh, or I'm sorry, hey, ready solar site. Like, I, you know, ultimately, like this isn't something that we're suggesting, hey, this is just a, a drop in solution that um, just move along, do things as as normal, uh, business as usual. And oh, if you want to grow forages, go do that, right? It's, it's not how this is going to work. Um, and so it's it's kind of this check, chicken or the egg scenario, right? What Where, where do we start? And that's where I, I think that we have to have a good handle on establishment quality yields that we could do some, uh, you know, ultimately, we're not there yet, but ultimately do some some sound economic modeling to say, yeah, here's 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 the potential. Um, from that point, then, you know, developers will need to have these considerations to say, well, what do we need to do to make a site that a farmer is willing to come in and manage for us on a commercial scale? Um, and, and with that, when I say, hey, ready solar site, I mean, I'm thinking of things such as, as alleyways, like, um, you know, Sarah mentioned there's, you know, 6,000 acre site in Ohio. So, you know, you don't want to do 6,000 acres of forages and have your alley widths as such that you're doing a full cut in the way down and a partial coming back over 6,000 acres, right? So those types of considerations, as you think about, um, you know, what does the, the, you know, safe operation of equipment look like at a commercial scale and how can we design these systems uh, so that, um, it has that in mind, right? That's not to say that there might not be some drop-in solution potential where you could, hey, you know, this is a good fit. It can it can be done here. But, you know, I think moving forward, we want to get to a point where we can kind of fine tune this and say, look, here are the turn radiuses that are necessary. Here are recommended alley widths or multipliers that you might look at for standard equipment and, and different alley situations. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, it's going to require the, the the ag sector and the solar sector start talking a little bit more. Looking at how do we optimize hay production in utility solar sites has could have huge implications for a lot of these solar sites in Wisconsin. And, you know, I want to I want to check in with you, Sarah, and see how your beans are doing right now. But I do want to see kind of what are the results that have come out of this research um, so far? You know, in general, like if, as we look at the, the alfalfa, um, you know, focusing in on say cr crude protein, uh, most of our samples were grading out as uh, I should say all of them um, were above premium, and most of them, um, just over half, were above prime levels. When you think about uh, percentage of of crude protein, so we were kind of in a range of nineteen to twenty six percent. You know, similar results when you look at um, alfalfa by uh, relative feed quality. Um, most everything was above premium, kind of in a range of 146 to 156. So, um, and, and those were, those are year two readings. So that's kind of um, excluding the establishment year as, as I kind of share those ranges. Um, and very similar results when we looked at the, the cool season hay mix. So uh, the one thing I will say is, uh, and, and again, these are all kind of lessons learned as we as we move through this and think about what it looks like on a commercial scale. Um, a couple of the the obstacles that we did face with, uh, with our establishment year, we really had a, a lot of foxtail that was kind of crowding out our cool season mix. Um, we were obviously we were able to spray the alfalfa and and kind of get that back on track, but uh, we really just had to kind of uh, mow down the the hay and and kind of cross our fingers going into year two. We were <laughs> kind of hoping that it would come in, and and it it, it did really kind of bounce back good in in year two. Uh, I think it's all but one of our our samples came in above premium, and about half of them came in above prime. So kind of think of a range like. 18 to 26 percent um and then uh, uh with your uh relative feed quality kind of th that same that 146 to 154 was kind of the range that of results that we saw with with again most of those grading out above premium how did the uh biomass production compare between the shade the ones under the solar panels and out in the sun in terms of like the, the actual uh, results to say like, here's what the yields were. I don't necessarily have that data um, in front of me. You know, visually the the stuff that was, uh, the forges that were in the full shade zone 
had kind of that deeper green, more lush kind of uh, appeal to him, and it appeared to be um, a little bit a, a, a little bit thicker. Um, again, I don't have like the yield results in front of me, but um, our initial thought was that you know that would really not perform well. And kind of as as we looked, I was like, well, there's actually you know possibly some advantages to that. Um, and so as you think about the difference, and, and that that was a shade zone that was kind of um, consistent your utility scale projects have single axis trackers. So it's it's gonna be a little bit more evenly dispersed, right? And not as intense and, and kind of focused into one area. So that might actually be um, you know, something that, that could benefit. And that's something that we're gonna really kind of zero in on, on our phase two research is how does, how does the shade being more evenly dispersed with a single axis tracker system um, impact this? But uh, the last thing I'd say in terms of shade versus um, full sun is it also um there seemed to be less weed pressure in, in that area as well oh interesting sarah how are yeah. your beans looking oh it's good news all around right <laughs> the, the, and and that's what i'm hearing now is like solar superpower is shade mm. um shade is protecting the plants you know with the soybeans we're seeing like a broader leaf development right because it's just like it's not the sun's not beating down on it right and like baking them out so um shade's been a good thing so it sounds like yeah good like you said good news all around but i'm sure there have been some challenges that you faced along the way can you just kind of speak to what some of those have have been some of the major challenges oh boy well i will say some of my biggest critics are farmers so, um, you know, of course, every farmer is the best farmer in the world and they can tell you how to do it better or that you can't do it like they can. Right. So I've had people tell me, you know, oh, hay won't grow here or that won't work. At first, they they didn't accept hybrids. Right. They didn't accept hybrid seed back in the day. And, and we had to plant, you know, hybrid seed in with our kids and the kids would grow it in the plot in the backyard. And when it outgrew daddy's corn, he, he realized he better start growing hybrids, right? So I think it's just that attitude of change where, you know, it, it, it will require a different type of farming. We've been used to clearing out fence rows, you know, for the last hundred years and making the biggest possible field we can and giant equipment. You know, we all want to run these huge planters and the, these, um, bigger corn heads or bigger, you know, um, draper heads on, on our equipment. And it's like, no, maybe we need to go back to a little bit smaller equipment, maybe some autonomous equipment, you know, and I think that that's going to improve soil compaction. That's going to help us with a lot of different things. Um, but that farmer mindset might be one of the bigger challenges I see, which I said, I work with my dad. So, you know, you, you get that um, as a farmer all the time. Um, as far as the industry goes, you know, I got to say Sh Savion has been wonderful. So they've been very progressive and forward thinking with agrivoltaics and they've allowed me a lot of rain to try things. Um, so I appreciate that. But like farmers get things done. We figure out solutions. And so though there are challenges, I, I feel like we've been able to overcome a lot of those. And, and especially with the help of Ohio State and, and the universities to provide that academic support. Um, on what we're trying to do. You mentioned a little bit about um, the big equipment equipment, and, you know, maybe we need to go smaller. And I'm just curious, are you, have you been having to use specialized equipment of any sort? And for the hay, are you, are you dry? Is are you trying to do dry hay? Or are you bagging it? That's a great question. Um, so right now we're using the equipment that we have. Um, and you'll find, you know, a lot of farmers still have that conservation planner in the barn somewhere, you know, we're doing our filter strips with something smaller, or we're working, you know, the smaller fields with something still so you can find it, um, you know, but as we're moving into a field of growing agrivoltaics, you know, we're hearing uh, Kubota is a partner on, on our uh, grant that, that Eric will talk about later, you know, and they're looking at smaller equipment, equipment that will work between the rows. Um, because when you get up to 6,000 acres, you're not going to want to run a 20 foot drill through there, right? It's a little tight. You, you want to have something that's specialized for it. So, um, and then the autonomous equipment makes so much sense. Um, you know, and all of our kids, they love video games and robots, right? So like 
getting them excited about this next generation of farming that's happening is, is playing into this precision ag equip equipment and some of these solutions we're finding. So I think starting out, it'll be a mix of both. Um, you know, we've got, I've got a hay bind that goes down through the rows, right? And it's just, it's just a regular thing you got parked, you know, here, here on the farm. So um, it'll be a transition time. I think we're all learning and I think that it will work a little bit both ways starting out. Yeah, and just to follow up on that for the for the hay, is it something that you're trying to dry out underneath the panels, or is it you know you're bagging it at higher moisture? Right. So we're actually we let it dry on the site on the between the rows site. We we let it dry. We raked it. You know, we did all of that. It actually got rained on once, and so we had to rake it up and and get it ready again. But we've we've talked about the solution of wet wrapping because if there's a case where you know, with your uh, single axis tracker, you know, you, you make hay when it, the sun shines and that's when I need my resource for my solar panels, right? So I'm not going to want to turn them and have a, make the row wider during the day. So the solution would be, of course, go ahead and cut and wet wrap it in the evening, late evening when the sun isn't something you're not going to lose the resource. So that's where, again, working with the solar company and finding solutions there. Um, I was recently in in Israel and they're looking at a lot of the different times of day and how the shading, you know, next tracker works with some of the, you know, the, the position of the sun in the sky, those kind of things. And I think those will be solutions you'll see in agrivoltaics um, moving forward here. How far are we away from being able to uh, scale this up to commercial scale? Do you feel like the, the research results are, are like we're getting near to that point? We have, um, utilized this data and kind of packaged into a Department of Energy proposal that was um, recently awarded. So we're kind of in the final negotiation phases um, of, of that award. So uh, we haven't technically started yet, but we're, you know, the project's been awarded. We're, we're kind of working with DOE to kind of dot the I's, cross the T's, and, and get a start date. Um, but, you know, I think that once we get through that research, you know, the first couple of years of that research, I think it'll tell us a lot in terms of how ready we are to say, here's how you go about best management practices to establish these forage systems in a thousand acre or, you know, Sarah, 6,000 acre site, right? Eric's a lot more maybe conservative than what I am. Madison Field sites in Madison County, Ohio, it's under construction right now. Um, and we have 1,200 acres inside the fence. I think about 440 acres is, is covered in panels or in, in glass, right? And that leaves us like 730 acres to between the rows, under the panels, um, outside of the rows, and all of that to farm. Um, the entire site will be seeded with a hayable, grazable mix, um, minus the, the test plot that that OSU needs where we're going to be doing hay and alfalfa and cover crops and and, and on a much larger scale than we had done it at, at between the rows. Um, but I'll tell you, yesterday we uh, double cropped our beans. We have um, on site right now. We picture your, you know, you've got your vegetative management plan, and there's not panels covering the whole site. We've got a 45 acre portion that's inside the fence. That's like a buffer, you know. Um, as you're coming up to the substation, we've got uh, some low line areas where we've used them as natural retention ponds, but they're only wet in the spring. So, so the farmers have always gone in and planted something in there. So we want them to let it go, go ahead and plant it. We've got 15 acres of soybeans growing there. Um, we've got another 70 acres, uh, a 70 acre strip where there was a, a tile main that we avoided in our design. So, so there's soybeans growing there. And it's cool because, you know, you see the construction team out there working, driving piles, um, hanging panels. And then you see, see my farmer go by, you know, in, in his tractor and they're waving at him, you know, and you've got, so we've got, you know, farm equipment operating inside the fence. Um, we harvested wheat the day before yesterday. We did our double cropped our beans into it yesterday. We got great drone footage of it and pictures. And, you know, I'm super excited about it. everybody laughs at me like, oh boy, it doesn't take much to get Sarah excited. But like, we are farming this site now. Um, and 
you know, Ohio State's going to come in and, and prove the the data behind it as far as the, the crude proteins and the biomass and the stuff for the things that we grow on site. But, you know, my farmer can tell you he's got yield from that weed already. Um, and there's no reason we, we shouldn't be having farmers work on these sites uh, where there's available land. So to kind of um, follow up on that, I guess, give you uh, the rest of the the picture, the story for for what our 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 research project is um, on that DOE grant. Um, you know, we really kind of look at it as four kind of core buckets of of, of research focus. And our first is is to kind of get replication on our forage crop production. So take what we learned with our our, our test pilot um, plots and put those into more of a commercial application. So you know we'll have like 35 acres of uh, our, our test plots that are under glass there. And then of course, control zones. Um, but, and again, that's that's gonna get to that point of, you know, how different are the, the results based on the construction practices or construction impact, right? Uh, the other thing that we're looking at is uh, complementary grazing. And, and so, you know, uh, Brady Campbell, who's our, our uh, sheep grazing specialist here at OSU, you know, Brady has been contacted by, I, I would say, every solar developer on the East Coast um, talking about, you know, grazing these sites. And it was like, there's not enough animals in North America to graze all the solar you guys want to put in in Ohio. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we were looking at, though, is, you know, if we can mechanically harvest most of the site and then obviously there's going to be strips next to the to the post that you don't want to get too close with equipment so um you know he's going to be doing some research with kind of i guess we've kind of tagged complementary grazing so we'll come in and harvest a zone and then he'll come in and kind of target graze that area to clean up the uh, around the the post and and so forth where we don't get too close with the the equipment um and of course he's going to be looking at you know, animal behavior and 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 health and weight gain and and you know equipment and and how you actually manage those herds within the uh, within the the zone. So that's our second bucket. The the third area uh, Sarah's touched on, and that's precision agriculture. So really looking at um, you know how do we utilize um, precision ag and 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 digital technology to to optimize the management of these sites. Um, you know, as you look at thousands and thousands of acres, potentially that we could be, um, you know, have potential to, to grow forage crops on. And so, um, again, Kubota is uh, our partner uh, on this DOE project with that. And we have uh, Dr. Shear here at OSU Ag Engineering kind of taking lead uh, on, on that aspect. And then the last one is uh, soil health. And that's that's one where, you know, we're really excited to um, to better understand what does the site look like post construction, right? So we have um, we have compaction samples uh, all across the site, and, and a lot of compaction samples in our research zone, uh, looking at you know what what were the compaction levels of this site as it's existed in a corn soybean rotation over the years, and we'll come in post construction and, and get a, a comparative reading to see okay, so how bad was the disturbance, um, and then from there. Um, you know, what series of cover crops could we use to, to help, you know, expedite the, um, you know, decompaction of, of those sites um, coming out of construction. So, you know, thinking of, you know, some deep tap-rooted type cover crops that could help break up those top soils and, and get them ready to, to, to put back into production. But, you know, that's one of the areas, and Sarah sees this as well. I mean, it seems like when, when you hear people talking about solar at this magnitude the the biggest the you know the biggest negative you hear is oh you're taking good prime farmland out of production and on the other end of that you hear well we can put it right back into production when we're done and i think the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle but we, we don't really know right we don't know what the impact to the site is but to just say that well we can't farm it again i think is is you know let's get some data to see and um you know i think the the ability to look at this on the construction side will give us the 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 right management practices when when you do look at kind of end of project life or decommissioning right so if we can identify strategies to decompact the soils using cover crops and, and different rotations after they construct it it's a very similar process to take it out right so then we can kind of apply that on the back end of of these projects to to help um, get them back into some type of production 
um, sooner rather than later. Well, all of that sounds pretty dang exciting. I'm I'm excited, Sarah. Um, I share your excitement, and we'll. It sounds like we're going to have to check back in in a couple of years to see how this much larger project is going uh, and updates from that. Well, is there anything that you all would like to add here at the end? I don't think you should wait that long to check in. Well, I think, <laughs> I think you need to come sooner. So hopefully we'll be seeding, you know, um, depending on how the DOE awards go. Um, you know, we're thinking this fall here to get to get the hand off alpha out so that we'll have something growing and have something for you to look at and come down and see. And and then we we keep mentioning this 6,000 acre project, you know, when that when that baby gets out there, we're going to be do, doing some real cool stuff. So um, it, it, it's exciting. It really is. And and I tell all those farmers out there, you know, instead of fighting it or saying it's not going to work, figure out how to be a part of it, you know, and uh, whether it's sheep or, or, you know, even dairy cows, you know, it doesn't have to be under the panels. There's so much buffer area involved with these sites. Maybe you need grazing, you know, maybe there's a solution there. Um, cooney cooney pigs, you know, people are grazing those. So there's lots of different solutions for these projects and, and farmers all have a side hustle. So um, they, they need to keep their, their ears open and, and, you know, their brains turning for ways to, to be involved because this is something that that's happening and, and it's, it's exciting. Great. Eric, any last thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, I, I would just echo um, Sarah's enthusiasm. I mean, this is something that, you know, as I mentioned, I've, I've been working, Christine and I've been trying to get this off the ground since like 2015, 2016, right? We've had, we've had three or four different sites along the way that it's like, okay, this is going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen. It's, <laughs> and so, you know, finding a, a partnership where, um, you know, they're truly interested in, in, you know, how can we do this better? And I, I think that that's a, a question we should all be asking ourselves. I mentioned, you know, earlier in the podcast, as we kicked this off, um, you know, everybody's favorite form of energy is one that's generated somewhere else, right? All of all of these different sources have their flaws, and there's there's no kind of silver bullet that this is our solution. Um, and and it's okay to say that out loud. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like people cringe when it's like, oh, well, this is a weakness of of solar. It's okay, right? There's there's a challenge. So how can we how can we try and address that? How can we try to minimize that? And that's you know that's what we're doing here. Is the the weaknesses? It takes up a lot of horizontal surface area. Um, but what we're trying to do is, is find ways that we can still, um, you know, have that as as productive ground that that can be feeding into multiple uh, ind industries. Um, you know, it, it kind of eliminates some of that, you know, pinning food versus um, uh, energy uh, against one another. And and so, you know, I think there's a lot of potential here. But uh, the the thing that is is really going to be critical moving forward is to make sure that, you know. We can identify these 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 little challenges and hiccups along the way, and and start to kind of flush them out, so that we can say, you know, here's your guide to doing this on a commercial scale. Here are the things you really got to look for as it relates to, you know, operating equipment in these zones, or you know, design considerations on the developers' end, so that we can get equipment through the alleys. Right? I mean, that's that's <laughs> that's a major deal. When when Sarah, when Sarah Sarah called me at one point and said, I don't I don't know, we, we're gonna not bury this DC cable. And it's like, well, we can't run tractors through the alley if the cables are there. And so those types of challenges are, they're real and they happen every day. But at the same time, it's that awareness, it's that communication that can say, look, here's what we can do. You know, how, how can we work together to, to make this this happen? And, um, and, and, you know, demonstrating that it can actually be done on a commercial scale. And then, and then when we get the economics, I think it's, it's really gonna change some things. Well, Sarah and Eric, thanks for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. This has been Field Notes from UW-Madison Extension. My name is Will Fulwider, Regional Crops Educator for Dane and Dodge Counties. A big thank you to Joe Ryan for creating our theme music and to Abby Wilkie-Maki for our logo. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today, or about your farming practices in general, reach out to the Extension Agriculture Educators, serving your region.